fifth lesson in unit five we're going to be examining how taxes work this is usually the lesson um, that students like the most because a lot of my students maybe this is your an exception though I don't have too many people that are under this category but a lot of my students in the past are at that age where they start working this year I have like maybe four but I've had as many as 20 kids maybe be working um, so they start this is basically where we start figuring out exactly what taxes are how they work future lessons we're going to talk about exactly what taxes are going to be taken from you um, because people are really surprised when we get that first paycheck like oh I thought it was going to make so much money and then oh nope sorry government took something from you so this is basically what we're going to be doing is examining how taxes work in this one next lesson from this so unit uh, unit 5 lesson 6 is going to basically look at what those taxes are like FICA social security you know what it exactly how do they take them from you and what is it used for so let's keep going uh, essential question how do taxes work and what impact do they have on the economy so that's our goal we're gonna try and figure that out as we go through this lesson then of course we're gonna transition right into you already know our learning targets there's a lot of them today this is a lesson that normally would take me two days in order to get through but because it's a video it will probably take me about 15 minutes uh, so first one identify the ways in which the government generates revenue differentiate between the benefits received principle and the ability to pay principle summarize the criteria that's used to evaluate taxes identify and describe tax bases that exist differentiate between the three tax structures that exist proportional progressive and regressive and identify how that impacts your state evaluate the impact that taxes have on the consumer and producer and then lastly describe the impact that taxes have on the economy so we're going to actually go ahead and tackle the first three learning targets all in one. We're going to identify the ways in which government generates revenue. We're going to differentiate, sorry, differentiate between the benefits received principle and the ability to pay principle. And we're going to summarize the criteria that's used to evaluate taxes. These are all pretty easy. I mean, I know that there's seven learning targets and it seems like a lot, like it's overwhelming. But I mean, we're not going to have three in one, so it's not that hard. All right, so the government revenue, the government provides goods for people. Um, maybe you don't know what those are. Uh, you know, roads, those were built by who? Those were built by the government. Um, other things, too, like parks, those are public goods. Um, they also provide you with services, too. You're sitting in school right now, or maybe, I mean, you could be viewing this at home, but that's a service that the government pays for. So, you know, how do they, how do they pay for that? That's generated through tax dollars. Um, you know, they have some other things too, services, fire department. And I've taught this lesson in the past. People are like, I don't even need the fire department. So I'm like, what are you going to do? Your house got just fire. You're going to take a garden hose and be like, Psh, and try and put it out that way. Get your neighbors to turn the sprinklers on. Hopefully you can put it out. So, you know, obviously things like those t uh, are th are need to be paid for. And basically the way they do it is going to be through taxes. Um, the government does have other revenue resources other than taxes. And those are usually through user fees. Like if you go to we're going to take a look at the, like the state park level. If you go to Belle Isle, now that the state park, you have to pay to get in. Now, that granted, that's a one-time fee, and that also gets you into any state park for the whole year. So you know, go ahead and take advantage of that if you can. I mean, there are state parks like on the west side of the state um, that are real nice to see that are on the ocean. Uh, not the ocean. That'd be That's really terrible. Um, on the lake. Um, so... You know, don't just go ahead and stick around to Belle Isle. I mean, obviously you can, um, but hey. Um, the other things, too, these are still in the form of taxes, though. When you have um, when you have a tariff on things, and a tariff is a tax on imported goods, um, normally we don't see too much of that. Um, with uh, President-elect Trump coming in, you might see a little bit more of that because he's already basically threatened companies that if you move to... Uh, move jobs out of the United States that um, he's going to basically slap a bunch of taxes on there. So that would just be another form of revenue as well. Moving on. Uh, principles of taxation. When it comes to taxation, we've got two principles. And the first one is the benefits received principle. You only pay for the benefits that you receive. So the state park one would be an example of benefits received. So um, if I don't go to a state park, I don't pay that type of, of taxation or that fee. Um, right, we said it wasn't taxed in the previous one, but um, I'll give you another one. Um, let's see. When you go in, for those of you who have a car, it's not necessarily a tax, but it is a fee. Um, so like for the state government, um, if you go out and you have a car, you got to pay for your registration, you got to pay for your license plates. Those are, you're having access to public goods by having those license plates they're allowing you to go ahead and drive 
Now, obviously, if you don't use those benefits, like if you don't use the roads to drive a car on, you're not going to pay for them in the form of uh, in the form of user fees. But keep in mind when they end up jacking the price up for um, for licenses and registrations, then as we talked in previous ones, that would be cost push inflation. It becomes more expensive to do business, and they're just going to go ahead and pass that cost on to you. Then you've got the ability to pay principle, which is those who have the ability to pay more are going to do so. And that can come in the form of the progressive tax that we're going to talk about very shortly and the proportional tax. Uh, of the three that we're going to reference later, which are the tax structures, um, basically regressive is the only one that's not going to fall under that ability to pay principle. That's actually the opposite. Those who p make it less are actually going to pay more in terms of a percentage of their income at least. So criteria for taxation. So when we look at a tax, we go ahead and we try and evaluate using three criteria. That's going to be equity, simplicity, and efficiency. And equity is basically how fair is it? Is it fair to everybody? Does it favor one group over another? Then simplicity, how easy is it to collect that tax? How easy is it for that tax to be understood? Then efficiency, did it actually collect? Did it do the things that it intended to do? So that kind of seems like three would be the, the most important one. But of course, one, you know, you don't want to sit there and have it favor one group over another. And two, obviously, is important as well, because if nobody understands the tax, how are you going to pay it? So that leads us into our first activity. Create a quick paragraph that explains how the government generates revenue, the principles that are associated with it, and the criteria that's used to evaluate those methods. There's also a political cartoon on page 411 of your textbook if you have that. See if you can figure out what the criteria it is that they're making fun of in this particular political cartoon. When you're done, you go ahead and move forward. Um, so let's get doing with that. Learning target four, identify and describe the tax bases that exist. So four types of tax bases exist. We've got the individual income tax. Um, some might also refer to that as the personal income tax. Now, that is something that you do not have to pay in every single state. Um, now, as far as the federal income tax, everybody pays that. Nobody gets out of that. But if I move to Florida or Texas, they don't have an individual income tax, so I actually make more money there. So one of the things I try and use for that is you had Sue from uh, the Lions uh, a few years ago. Now, he's with Miami right now. So what I try and explain to students is if you offered Sue $100 million as a Detroit Lions and then Miami offered him $100 million, he would actually make more money with the Miami Dolphins because he would not be giving up part of his, individual, part of his salary to the individual income tax. Now, one of the ways that states get around that is because of number three, so we'll get to that in a little bit. Corporate tax rate, um, you had presentations that you did. You would have heard about corporate tax, like double, double taxation. But corporate tax rate is basically you pay 35% of your profits. Now, if you have losses, like if you, if you actually took a loss, so let's say that you, instead of making $10 million, you lost $10 million. Well, you, you can't pay taxes on losses. Um, so any, any particular profit that you make, you'll end up paying a tax on that as a corporation. Sales tax, it's pretty self-explanatory. You basically pay a tax on the, uh, on the items that you buy. Now, there are some exceptions for that. If you go to the grocery store and you buy food, uh, that is not taxed. And one of the reasons for that is they don't want to make it harder for people on low income to feed themselves. Um, now, if you buy you know, a cooked chicken or prepared food from the deli counter, that gets taxed because some, somebody made that for you. That's why when you go to McDonald's, you have a tax on it or Subway or Pizza Hut or whatever. Somebody made that food for you. But if you just go and you buy cereal and milk and eggs from the grocery store, there's no tax on that. Um, so that leads us to our fourth one. Oh, back to three, though. Not every single state has sales tax. I think there's two that don't. I don't recall which ones they are. Uh, but they'd be listed in your textbook. You've got a property tax as well. Basically what you're doing is you are paying a tax based on the value of your property. The more value your your uh, your property is, the higher you're going to pay in taxes. So like if you just own land with nothing on it, then the value of your land is not going to be that much. Once you put a house on it, then the value is going to go way up. The nicer the house, the more expensive taxes you have. And those basically are things that are taken care of. Like when we look at how 
cities get income that's a big way that cities generate revenue is through property tax and what they end up doing is they use a tax assessor that's someone whose job is to figure out how much is the value of your land and then assess you on it and basically jam you up with some taxes based off of that so if you ever make improvements to your home it's okay usually tax rates don't change all that much except for when you buy a new house so like for instance um, I live in a new neighborhood, um, so a lot of the taxes that were being paid were based off of when the land didn't have any house on it. So people go in there and they, they pay the first taxes on it. And then the tax assessor comes through and uh, figures out, oh, you got a house on it, and that house is worth $250,000. So we're going to go ahead and jam you up with some new tax, with a higher tax rate. Not a higher tax rate, but you're going to have to pay more in taxes because a higher tax rate would mean I'd charge you a higher tax percentage, but that's not really the case. So with, people were getting outraged, like, well, why, do, why did my taxes go up so much? Because they changed ownership, and they went out and reevaluated the worth of your land. When that land was originally bought, it was only worth a couple thousand dollars. Now you've got a house on it, it's worth $250,000, so you're going to pay more in taxes. So people get upset, but once they figure out why they had to pay more, they still weren't happy, but at least they understood. So we've got four types of tax bases. Um, for, so four types of taxes, we got, I already talked about that, sorry, I got to delete that slide when we come through uh, and do it again. So let's just do this activity to create a graphic organizer that identifies and describes the tax bases that exist. So I just basically went through them right here, right? Individual income tax, corporate income tax, sales tax, and property tax. How much of that can you actually do? Um, you can put it in like a modified T-chart that goes across four categories. You could do a... You do whatever you want. It's up to you. It's a, uh, it's a, just whatever graphic organizer you can come up with. And when you're ready to move on from there, you can do our learning target five. We're going to differentiate between the three tax structures that exist, which are proportional, progressive, and regressive. We're going to identify how that impacts your state. So we got three types of tax structures that ex that exist. We've got proportional. Now, what you might hear somebody say is that it's a flat tax. Um, that's what it commonly is referred to as. A lot of Republicans try and run on the idea of proportional tax. So proportional tax also feeds into, at least in my opinion, the ability to pay principal. So basically, here's how a proportional tax works. Uh, let's just say it's 10%. Everybody pays the same percentage. So if you only made $1,000, you would pay $100 in taxes. And if I made $100,000, I would make 10, or excuse me, pay $10,000 in taxes. So each of us are paying the same percentage, but you can also see that I paid a whole lot more in taxes than you did. Now, progressive taxes, basically the way I try and explain that is the more you make, the more the federal government is going to take, or the state government too. So in this case, if you made $10,000, and this is just me, I'm just using numbers to try and make it easy to understand, but if you made $10,000, the government takes 5% from you, where if you made $100,000, the government pays, excuse me, takes 20% from you. So not only did I pay more in taxes when I made $100,000, I also had to pay a higher tax rate too. Now, regressive taxes, by the way, proportional tax, a lot of those are... Um, some states can go ahead and have proportional individual taxes, uh, so on income, and then your corporate tax, everybody pays 35% uh, before deductions occur. All right, so to finish up with our last three of the, our last one of the tax structures, we're going to have a third one, regressive. Basically, what that means is that those who pay, I'm sorry, those who make more in income will end up paying less of their income and taxes and the one main one that you all have to pay is when you have a job is going to be the social security tax so how the social security tax works is you have to give up six percent of your income up to a hundred I think it's a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars right now your book will have a different number in it but your book is also like a decade old so it uses old information um, so once I get past a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars or whatever the new number is these days it could go up with a new president coming in, it could go down. With a new president coming in, it could stay the same. But once I get past $115,000, it's like you're free from having to pay that tax again. Now, what students get confused on is they think that, oh, well, I'm good for like ever. No, you're only good for the rest of the year. So if you made over $115,000 on the last, like the, in 
by the end of November, well, congratulations in December, you're done paying taxes in terms of Social Security, just Social Security. And then once January 1st hits again, you have to start paying Social Security tax all over again. So one of the things we did when we first started teaching this class is I took a look at Miguel Cabrera's contract, and he was make, he just made a, a signed a $25 million a year um, contract with the Detroit Tigers. So I'm wondering... I got. I'm never gonna make over 115 thousand dollars, as far as I can see. Maybe something will happen in the future. I don't know about, but so I'm stuck paying six percent for Social Security until I stop working. But Miguel Cabrera, obviously, he's done paying Social Security tax probably with one game check. So we took a look at exactly how much of how much of a percentage of his pay is actually paid in Social Security. So if I can recall, it was like less than even a half percent where I'm paying six. So you can see where he did pay, he is going to pay more in taxes total with Social Security, but he pays less of his income, like the total percentage of his income than I do. So, you know, he pays a half percent, but pays a lot more than I do. And then where I pay 6% and pay a lot less in total dollars. So proportional, you can think of that, again, as um, everybody pays the same. We'd be identifying that with the corporate tax rate as well as your um, some state income taxes. Progressive, that's going to always be an easy one. That's going to be your federal tax and regressive. Social Security, there is some argument that the uh, sales tax is a regressive tax, too. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but if you have to come up to trying to defend it, like list one or the other, I would just go ahead and say regressive. Okay. Uh, third activity of the day, create a paragraph that describes the three tax structures that exist and provide examples of where I would find each structure in society. I gave you those already. Create a paragraph arguing for the adoption of a progressive tax system or a proportional tax system. I mean, do you think it's fair that somebody who makes a whole lot more money than you pays a higher percentage and a higher total in taxes? If you do, I mean, that's progressive for you. If you think that somebody should pay a higher, I mean, the same percentage as you, and if that means that they make more money than you, that they'll pay more than you, but you paid the same percentage of your income, then you're a fan of the proportional tax system. This doesn't mean come up with a... Uh, this tax system of your own, just try and create an argument for one or the other. So give you some time for that, or you can take time for that, it's a video, you can just pause it and do what's necessary. Um, and then we can move on to the next part, which is learning target six, we're going to evaluate the impacts that taxes have on the consumer and the producer. So when we're talking about the impact of a tax, we're talking about the incidence of a tax, and the incidence of, ta of a tax is the final burden of the tax. So Taxes impacts producers and consumers differently. Now, when we're looking at incidence of a tax, we basically look at uh, inelastic goods and services. If it's inelastic, I'm throwing out a term you need to know from back in your supply and demand days. So we're talking like back in October, I think I covered this. So an inelastic good, in case you don't remember, basically is it's a good or service that does not have a lot of substitute goods for it, and it tends to be a necessity. So if you tax something that I need, let's say you tax medicine, I'm not going to sit there and go and, um, and find an alternative for it because it probably doesn't exist. Like if you threw a new tax on insulin, there's no substitute goods for insulin. I can't go out and buy a different type of medicine that's going to do the same thing. So in that case, when you tax things that are inelastic, things that there's no substitute goods for, there's very little of it, and I need it, then the tax is going to hurt the consumer. Because remember, if you put a tax on any good or service, that's going to raise the price up um, you, because the, the producer's not going to sit there and be like, oh, I'm good with just making less money, so I'm not going to change the price. So they're going to change the price regardless. So if it's an inelastic good, it's going to hurt the consumer. Now, an elastic good is going to hurt the producer. If you went ahead and... I don't know, you, t you put a new tax on uh, SUVs, so like Explorers and Escalades. Well, there's a plenty of types of substitute goods for that. I go buy a car. I can go buy a truck. I can go buy a minivan. I don't want a minivan, but I could. I could. There's plenty of different substitute goods for that. So it's going to hurt the producer, so the demand for those goods and services are going to drop off drastically because people don't want those goods and services 
because they have become more expensive and you have something else that you can go ahead and buy in its place. So if it's a inelastic good, incidence of attacks on a good or service, it will fall on the consumer. And if it's a elastic good, it's going to fall on the producer. So summarize how taxes impact both producers and consumers and how they affect the economy. So really we're just basically looking at can you tell me about the incidence of attacks? Can you tell me when incidence of attacks would fall on the consumer? And can you tell me about when an incidence of attacks would, uh, would fall on a producer? When you're done with that, we can move forward. So we've got learning target seven. It's going to be our last one. Describe the impact that taxes have on the economy. So any tax placed on a good or service will cause the supply curve to shift to the left. So think back to your lesson on government regulation. So that would be back in chapter five when you had supply. So Anytime the government goes ahead and puts uh, increases the cost of doing business, it becomes more expensive to make the product. And so because of that, I, have, I can't make as much as I used to. So a producer may choose to make a different good or service because the taxes could make their original items less profitable. If you're going to tax something so much that I end up selling a whole lot less of them and my, my uh, profit is very little... Well, why would I continue to make that product? I, would, I wouldn't. I would go and find something else that's not taxed so heavily and just go ahead and, um, and make that. I mean, not exactly an example, but if you're familiar with Stroh's ice cream, I mean, they were kind of forced into changing it because um, they used to be, and they still are now, they used to make beer. But they made beer when they started out. Um, they were before Prohibition had occurred. So when Prohibition occurs, they're like, well, I can't even make beer anymore. What am I going to do? So they allocated their resources. They took their money and started making something else. So when you tax something too much and it makes it hard to sell, they're going to go ahead and allocate their resources and make something else. So, again, businesses are always out to make what's more profitable. I mean, you don't see Sony making PlayStation 2s anymore because no one wants to buy them because they're not very profitable. But then again, that's not because of government regulation. That's just a different decision. Productivity and growth, high taxes on interest and dividends cause people to invest and borrow less. So when people invest less, that means that they're spending less money because uh, like an, an example of an investment, if a company is going to invest, then like investing would be creating a new uh, factory to build cars and uh, borrowing money. When I borrow, if I can't borrow as much money as I used to because there's taxes on it involved in it, um, then I'm not going to spend as much money as I had. Uh, previously and high taxes on income can discourage work um, you have people who even in high school they wonder why do I keep working when you take so much money from me so the higher you make taxes the the less people want to work um, you might sit there and go well I'll just work more hours but at some point you start to maybe believe that it's not really worth your time because you rather have your leisure time you'd rather be at home doing whatever it is you want to do rather than being at work um, high taxes can result in an underground economy um, you know, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just work. I'm going to cut grass and I'm going to shovel snow. And I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to hide my income from the government. Um, remember, that goes back to gross domestic product on why they can't exactly track it, why it's not perfect. So people start doing jobs that they don't report income to the government because they want to keep all their money. You might hear of uh, individuals who do a job, who work a job, and they say, well, I get paid under the table. And that's just a term for when people pay, uh, get paid but they don't actually you know get like a paycheck in terms of where they have deductions taken out of their check and we'll get into deductions in a different lesson but um, basically working under the table is I work for cash and I don't pay any taxes on it that's considered underground economy as well um, so economic behavior a government does try and encourage and discourage the activity uh, of people through tax incentives um, Rebates for buying energy-efficient appliances or windows, um, fuel-efficient cars. There was like that cash for clunkers um, program that was out not too long ago. So they do try and encourage some type of uh, economic activities. Um, and then we, they also try and discourage some things too, like uh, the bottom here. It says sin taxes. So those are taxes that they place on things that it's not illegal to do them, but they try and discourage people from doing it. So liquor has a tax on it. Tobacco has a tax. Tobacco is always getting taxes raised on it. I mean, I've sat there at a gas station pumping gas, and somebody from Kentucky comes up and starts complaining to me about how high cigarettes are. And, of course, I'm just looking at them like, great, I don't really care. But, um, again, we're not trying to make them illegal, but we're trying to prevent them. So, like, in states where, you know, marijuana is legal, you have a high tax on it. 
because it might be legal. They're not trying to encourage you to do those things, but they're going to tax it anyways. Um, you have some things like tax breaks, too, to try and open up uh, businesses in low-income areas. Um, if you look at the president-elect coming in, some of the platform he ran was, you know, he's trying to bring in businesses to places like Detroit or other urban areas that are suffering with unemployment. And one of the ways he's, you know, he's proposed doing that, and this isn't just him, you know, it's not like Donald Trump was the first person to do this. People have run on this platform for like ever. Um, he's going to give them a tax, or they're going to get a tax break. So I'm going to pay less in taxes. So we go ahead and um, we we build uh, build jobs there. Um, we did that for the movie industry in Michigan for a while. We gave a bunch of tax breaks to. Uh, companies to come in and film here, and then once the governor decided to take that tax break away, those companies stopped filming in Detroit and in the Michigan area and went to other states where the taxes were more favorable. So that's something that you have to keep in mind, too, because when you raise taxes on businesses too much, they can go ahead and move to other states. So, like, California has lost businesses because they love California loves to raise the taxes. They are very deep into uh, trying to raise taxes uh, at times. Um, so what businesses have done is they've just basically said, you know, this is too much. I'm, I'm out here to make money for me, not make money for the government. So they just pack up stuff and they move to other states that are, have a better business climate for them. Because you got to keep in mind, when you make things too expensive for companies, they don't want to be around anymore. That's why we do have a 35% tax rate for your corporations here in the United States. It becomes hard to attract businesses to the United States because I can go ahead and move to Canada and pay less. And that's what Burger King did. Burger King is now a Canadian company because when they bought Tim Hortons, uh, they moved their headquarters to Canada. Tim Hortons was originally a Canadian company. And so when Burger King bought Tim Hortons, they took the opportunity to be like, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and move to Canada because you pay less in taxes. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we don't need to go into those because it's not necessary for this particular lesson. So this is going to be your last activity which is activity eight. We're going to explain how taxes impact the economy in the three ways listed below. So it's resource allocation, productivity and growth, and economic behavior. When you're finally done with activity eight, then you're going to be okay with going on to uh, going on to reviewing your learning targets. Can you do all seven of those without any sort of book, notes, any help? I mean, you know the drill by now. This is the fifth lesson. Can you actually do those? If you can't, I get students all the time like, oh, yeah, I can do all those, Mr. Norton. I'm like, all right, well, help me out with number three. Hold on. I got to look it up real quick. If you got to look it up real quick, you don't even know it. Don't even, I mean, that's just pointless. What are you going to sit there on a test and be like, you know what? I knew that one, but I got to look it up. Well, you out of luck. So you might as well just give up on it right now. Um, take the L, whatever you got to do. One through seven, if you can do those, great. And that's how it's going to go with all the other lessons, too. If you can do those learning targets, and the essential questions, you are you're going to be just fine. There's nothing that I can ask you or any teacher teaching economics in Chandler Park this year could ask you on a test that isn't related to those learning targets. And since I make all the tests for economics, I know that um, all the questions that are on the test are related to learning targets. So you'll be just fine if you can do all those. And of course, as I just said, putting it together, how do taxes work and what impact do they have on the economy? That's it for this lesson. Hopefully you got something out of it. Obviously you can fast forward, rewind, and see as much as you need uh, in the future. So good luck.